is a challenge to really understand the full story of Made in Abyss. There's a lot of character and the time is often vague and convoluted. Time in the Abyss moves different at each layer, so we don't have an exact date for anything. But I will still try to give an approximated date for the sake of simplicity. So without further ado, let's get right into it. The Abyss is form of 7 layers, each with their own ecosystem. To descend into Abyss is challenging because of all the dangers that lies there but much more challenging is to ascend back to the surface. Because if you try to do even a few steps up, the curse of the Abyss will trigger. As you go down the symptoms are more dangerous and little. From the first layer where you'll feel just a bit dizzy to the seventh layer where it's certain death. I will go deeper into the ecosystem of the abyss in another video. For now I would just want to make you aware of the curse. The oldest science of life in the abyss is present through the interference units and maybe the artifacts. Both of them appear to be created by someone or something. We don't know too much about it of the origins of the artifacts. We only know that all of them has unique and useful powers and all of them are scattered across the abyss. But I think that it's safe to assume that they were created by whoever inhabits the seventh layer or much deeper. It is speculated that the creatures there are an advanced civilization mainly because of the interference units which are robots that can think and act freely just like a normal being. They were sent there by their creators into each layer to gather information about the abyss and what's in it. The interference units are not affected by the curse because they are machines, they are not living things. They were sent there most probably because whoever created them is affected by the curse and cannot go up. Another creation of them is possibly the species of Reg. He looks like a combination between a human and an interference unit. He is as well unaffected by the curse. We don't know if Reg species was created just recently or long time ago but we know that the interference units are very old. Hundreds if not even thousands of years old. The abyss was discovered 1900 years ago. The interference units were placed into each layer, even the first layer and yet nobody found a sign that they existed except from the sixth layer. So basically very old, but also like I said the times move different into the abyss so we don't know exactly if that's true or not. Ozen claims that your sense of time breaks once you enter the abyss and the effects are much more extreme from the sixth layer onwards. Moving on to the outside of the abyss. More than 1900 years ago exists a tribe who lived on the island where is the abyss. The tribe was aware of the civilization located on the sixth layer and the golden city. They have a tradition where they paint their body to imitate the patterns of the inhabitants of the golden city. In the tribe fertility is very highly valued and if someone happens to be infertile will be sent into the abyss as a sacrifice. They even have some good understanding of the abyss and the curse. How they know all this information about the sixth layer and the abyss? As usual we don't know. At some point a group named Ganja was formed. It was a suicide corpse of outcasts. Their primary goal was to reach the abyss and discover the golden city and maybe to make a new life there. The most important members were Vueco, who was an orphan tortured physically and verbally by a cruel man. At one point in her life she gained a compass from an old man who had vision of the abyss and seems terrified to death by it. The compass indicates the direction of the abyss, so with this tool she joined Ganja into a trip to that place. The other two important members were Belaf, a pretty smart guy, and Wazukan, the leader of the group. He was also some kind of a prophet predicting the events that had to come, saving his men from many dangers but we will see more of his prophecy later. They started sailing towards the abyss but only the main ship survived and reached its destination. There they meet the tribe that we discussed earlier. Belaf was able to understand their language and so the tribe agreed to give them information in exchange for the compass. Also a child who was exiled from the tribe because she could not bear children joined them into the abyss guiding them to avoid the dangers. They reached the fifth layer and the elevator that will bring them into the sixth layer. But for the elevator to work you'll need a key, a white whistle. 
but it's not that simple to get one. In order to create one, someone has to sacrifice himself and give the permission to be used as a whistle by one person that they care about, and only that person. And the person that was transformed into a whistle, it's not dead, it's still conscious, so who will be sacrificed and live the rest of the days as a whistle in order to let the rest of the crew to go further? Oh, there's already a strange blob-like creature holding one right here. Let's see what happens if you put this creature in the middle of the elevator. Oh, oh, yeah, it actually works. Yeah, it seems like those guys have some insane luck to find that someone already did that before them. Also, this creature is not a normal one. This is known as a hollow. If a human tries to go into the sixth layer and climb back, the curse will transform them into this blob thing. When they arrive at the sixth layer, there was no human there, despite of what the tribe was saying. The only thing close to a human was the interference units, who learned their language in just a few minutes. Wazukan wanted to test if the elevator can rise back and put two men to go up. And when the elevator came back, well, they transform into the blobs as well. So there was no return from that point. The only thing that they can do is to start a new life and create a home here. Also, Vueco and the tribe girl named I Irumi, I Irumi, well, the fuck for the fuck's sake. Irumi become good friends. So with the help of the interference units they find a spot where they start to live in. The only problem was to find the source of water and food. Well, food was everywhere with all the monsters who inhabit this lair and they eventually find water, but we'll discuss just in a bit why that was still a problem. Irumui was still bothered by the fact that she can bear any child, and that being the reason why she was exiled. Everything seems to be fine and they finally can live a normal life. Until the sickness struck. Fever and diarrhea were the main symptoms. Not only that, but their body seems to melt or something. Yeah, remember that water? Well, the cave from where they found the water was not actually a cave. It was a very old animal corpse and even the water was not just water. It was a living organism and that so-called water was infected with eggs. So they should stop drinking the wa 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 can what the wa the water is infected okay. This man already was eating bugs, but this is too much. And the worst thing about diarrhea is that you need to stay hydrated in order to survive, and that's the only source of water, so uh, yeah, they just continued drinking that water because there was no other option. And I think you already guessed that this only made the situation worse. Luckily for them, fate was on their side. A part of the group found a strange egg in their search for food. The egg was an artifact, a very powerful one named Cradle of Desire. It was able to grant the user their deepest wishes, so because of that it was more suited for a child than an adult. But of course, don't think the wish is granted that easily. There was not too much time left for them until the sickness will get to everyone, so they gave the egg to Irumui. And this is the point where Wazukan prophecy will start to become true. As Wazukan said, that kid will be our salvation. So what do you think a child who was exiled because she could not bear any child will wish? Oh yeah, she wishes for everyone to be saved. No, she wished for a child. But in order for that to happen, her body was transformed and twisted. And much worse, the children she gave birth to didn't have any organs for ingesting food. So the baby died the next day. Irumui was destroyed by this. Not long after that, she had another baby. But that died too. And then another, and another, and another, and you get the idea. And she suffered and cried every time one of her childs died. Meanwhile, the sickness finally got Vueco. It seems like this will be the end for everyone, but Wazukan prophecy, it has not yet been fulfilled. Wazukan feed everyone a soup. And that soup seems to have cured all of them of their sickness. But Belaf seems still a bit, well, how to say it? <laughs> Not well? Why? <laughs> well, uh, Irumui has been transformed beyond recognition. She even lost her ability to speak. Now she is extremely similar to the Hollows. The only thing she knows now is her baby and Vueco. The soup was made actually from her babies. It is even more effective if the baby is still alive. Well, this is the point where people consider Wazukan to be a villain. 
but it's much more complicated than that. He did everything to save his crew and he actually did it. Not in the best way, but everything is like this in the abyss. Oh, and Belav just become dead inside, because he could not bear the guilt of him eating Irumui children's. One of the reasons why she become more monstrous is because Wazukan has given to her a second egg to amplify her wish. People started to pray to Yurumiui because it was their salvation as Wazukan said. She even grew extremely large. At some point she started to move to the center of the hole and root herself into the location. Everybody follow her, well, almost everybody. And when they arrived there, sadly, Belaf just couldn't take it anymore, so he begged Irimui to devour him. She opened some sort of a jelly door and transformed Belaf into a hollow, but not your usual hollow. His body was transformed, but his mind and memories were still intact. When the rest of the Ganja saw this, instead of being scared, they were happy and astonished. I guess staying too much into the abyss could only drive you crazy. Everybody gives themselves to Irumui and are transformed into hollows. Except Vueco, who is the only one who thinks that this is not okay. So she jumps off a cliff. But Wazukan doesn't let that happen, because without Vueco, Irumui will probably die, or how Wazukan says, her wish will no longer be fulfilled. It's even revealed that he used one of the eggs on him. He grabbed Vueco and locked her in a room inside Irumui, where she is connected to her feelings. In this way, Irumui will be kept alive. Now everybody lives inside Irumi's body. They made a village there and called home. Even the curse is absent from this location, so they can move freely there. And Irumui's body keep growing to the point that becomes massive. The only problem was that they can no longer leave that place. They're all stuck there. But for them it's fine, because it's saved her. Her body cannot be destroyed by any other creature. But this is not really the end for Irumui. When Wazukan was transformed into a hollow, Irumui take the egg from him and now she has three eggs in her possession. With them her wish is finally granted. She gives birth to a child, one that's actually alive and healthy. Her name is Fapta. At her birth, she inherits the three eggs and the will of her mother. All the agony and suffering was manifested into this child. And now her goal is to free her mother by killing all the villagers who did this to her. And ultimately to kill her mother. The reason why she cannot do that right away is because she cannot pass through the jelly door. As she said, a baby cannot return to his mother womb. So now she needs to find a way to make a hole into the village to get there, but this will be hard because like I said nothing can break the walls. So she will need to wait for quite a while until an opportunity will appear. Until that time we can finally move to other events. At some point after the Ganja had traveled to Abyss, the tribe who lived around the Abyss suddenly vanished. We don't know why or how. We only know that was more than 1900 years ago. Because it was not recorded to be present by the first explorer that officially discovered the abyss. So after the abyss was discovered, a lot of explorers started going to that place either for wealth, information or just for the sake of an adventure. This eventually led to the creation of Ort, a town built around the abyss, where adventurers and explorers could live, train and buy new equipment. Even scientists and researchers want to go into that town so they could learn more about the abyss and what's in there. Many many years after that, like only 50 years ago, a lot of the big explorers and researchers that we know today start to make an appearance. In this period Ozen becomes a white whistle at the age, well, somewhere around 20. Not much time after this, Bondrud start to research the abyss, but he was much more obsessed about his work. To obtain funds for his research he usually sold drugs and other artifacts on the black market. And even his methods used for obtaining new information wasn't too orthodox. He usually experiments on humans, so a lot of people send bounty hunters after him but none of them returns. So nobody approached him after that, even his experiments were allowed to continue due to his outstanding results. Around let's say 25-30 years ago a girl named Liza was born in Orth and at a very young age she becomes a disciple of Ozen. She was a very talented explorer and she was even known as Liza the Annihilator because she eliminated every creature encounter in the abyss. 50 years ago Bondrud managed to steal a special grade artifact Zoaholic 
I think that's how we pronounce it. This artifact has the ability to spread his consciousness on multiple bodies. He created the Umbra Hand to help him to research and for backup bodies, in case something happened to the current one. He established a large operating base in the fifth layer where he will do most of his experiments. 12 years ago, Liza started an expedition with Ozen and other explorers where she meets a guy named Torka. They fall in love and for the most of it, the expedition who took around 11 months, Liza was pregnant. Lisa hoped to finish the expedition and climb back before the child was born. But sadly the expedition didn't go as expected. Torka died during an unknown incident and the artifact they were after was lost. And the worst of all it's that Liza couldn't return in time to the surface and so her baby was born in the abyss. Liza fell into depression and despair after this event. At the time Ozen was carrying an artifact named Curse Wandering Box. The box has the effect to nullify the curse. They intended to use it to transport Liza child to the surface. Ozen was kinda frustrated about Liza's state so in a rage moment she shoves the dead baby into the box, preparing to leave. In that moment everyone was shocked when they saw that the dead baby was starting to move again. After it was confirmed that the baby was reborn, Liza and Ozen carried the box back to Earth. Turns out that the effect of the box was not to nullify the curse but to revive the person inside. The curse will still affect the person but thanks to the box, whatever is placed inside will come back to life seemingly unaffected. The catch is that the person will die anyway, it will only prolong the life of that person by a bit. The only exception from that was Liza's child, Rico. Not longer after this, Liza made sure to hide the fact that she was her daughter, with only a handful individuals being aware of this information, as she was scared that her enemies would target her. Two years after this event or 10 years ago, Liza started her last dive into the abyss with the goal to reach the deepest point of the abyss. From what we know, she at least reached the seventh layer and possibly encountered the creators of the interference units. But this is just speculation. The only thing we know for sure is that she met the hybrid race between a human and an interference unit, the one who was discussed at the beginning of the video and it also suggested that she has met Reg around the seventh layer. Still 10 years ago, Bondrud started one of the cruel experiments so far. Someday he offered children who wanted to unreveal the secret of the abyss the opportunity to come with him at his base at the fifth layer, known as Edo front, but he forgot to mention that they were going to be used as test subjects. Two of these children were Nanachi and Miti. Bondred wanted to test a phenomenon named Bless of the Abyss. To achieve this he modified several artifacts to create two elevators. The experiment works like this. Two persons will be selected and each one will enter in one elevator. One person will receive a double curse of the abyss and the other one will be spared by the effect and instead will receive the bless of the abyss. This was only tested on the sixth layer so we don't know if it works at any other layer. The problem was that the person who received the blessing dies on the way up. Bondru tested this on all children until only two remain, that being Nanachi and Miti. Nachi survived but the side effects of the blessing transform him or her, it's not confirm what gender has so we'll just call him. So he started grow fur all over his body and other mutation like bunny ears and a tail. But the blessing has more effects. The best one is to see the curse which is invisible for a normal person and he can detect nearby dangers thanks to that. Sadly Mitty was not so lucky. She was transformed into a hollow but a special one. She was immortal. When both of them arrived back Bondrud was very impressed by the results. Turns out that in order to receive the blessing the two person needs to have love for each other. After this Bondrud started to experiment with Mitty immortality. Every time a limb or any body part was cut it would be regenerated back. Even poison had no effect. The only way he harmed her was when he used an artifact named Paramago. Okay I'm very bad with name. Her eye didn't regenerate after that. It also worth mentioning that at one point Bondru traveled with Mitty on the sixth layer and tried to sell her to Belaf, but the two of them didn't reach any agreement, so he just returned back with Mitty. 
Nachi couldn't see his friend being tortured anymore so he decided to take Mitty and escape from that place. She went to the fourth layer where he constructed a hideout from there to live. Shortly after, one of Bond Root's Umbra Hand had a daughter but due to an accident she was affected by the curse of the fifth layer. She suffered mental and physical trauma but Bond Root wanted to keep her alive so he helped her to recover and adapted her. A few months ago, Reg started a mission that we don't know about and he needed to arrive at the top of the abyss. On his way, he meets Liza on the seventh layer and then on the sixth layer, he meets and befriends Fapta. Reg had a special artifact named Incinerator with the ability to destroy anything even other artifacts. When Fapta learns about this, she begs Reg to help her to free her mother. Reg promises he will help her, but only after he finishes his mission, and they will go into an adventure after all is done. Reg continued to climb the abyss until... Two months ago, Rico was attacked by a creature in the first layer, and Reg saved her with his incinerator, but faint. When he wakes up, it's revealed that he lost all his memories, so he no longer remembers his mission and his encounters with Liza and Fapta. A few days after, Liza sent a letter and her white whistle to Rico. When they saw a drawing of Reg, both of them decide to go into the abyss. Rico wanted to explore and find her mother, and Reg wanted to regain his memory. And so the adventure finally begins. A lot of the things that Reg and Rico learned in their journey was already discussed, so we will quickly go through them. When they reach the third layer, they meet Ozen and Rico learns about her mother and about her birth. After Ozen deems them worthy, she lets them continue their journey. On the fourth layer, they were attacked by a very dangerous creature and Rico was poisoned by it. But they were saved by Nanachi, who was following them to find out what they are doing there. When Nanachi saw Reg's desperation, he decided to help them and save Rico. In turn, Nanachi asked Reg to kill Mitty with the incinerator. And eventually he agrees and Mitty dies. After Rico is healed, they ask Nanachi to join them and he accepts. All three of them reach the fifth layer, but the problem is that the only way to reach the sixth layer is only through Idofont and Bondrud. When they arrive them, Bondrud welcomes them with open arms and introduces Prushka to them. Bondrud congrats Nanachi for finding a way to kill Mitty. He tries to make a deal with him to let Rico and Reg go, but Bondru say that's a bit late for that because Umbra Hands already started to experiment on Reg. He never encountered something like Reg before so he was super intrigued to learn about him. In the process Reg loses his right arm. They tried to fight Bondrut but that was quite hard because he just transferred his mind into the next body. After that Bondrut started his plan which was to use Prushka and other children's to gain the blessing of the abyss. That's why he adopted her, to love him as a father and meet the requirement from the blessing. A big fight started between Reg and Bondrud and with the help of Rico and Nanachi they defeated him for good. Or at least they thought so. Prushka, who was now just a sweet case filled with meat, was transformed into a white whistle and chose Rico as her owner. The whistle also has the power to awake dormant artifacts and it seems that Reg is affected by it. This can mean that Reg is a living artifact but we don't have enough information about that so it's not confirmed or anything. Now they have everything ready to go to the sixth layer. Before they leave they saw Bondrut with a new body so he is still alive but he doesn't try to stop them. He accepts his defeat and so he lets them go and probably will not bother them for now on but it's very unlikely they will meet again. So all three of them plus Prushka the white whistle embark on the elevator to the sixth layer. On the way there ricochets into the elevator. Yeah, I will just say only that. Not too long after the arrival, Prushka was stolen by Fapta and bring to Ilubu village to be upgraded. Ilbu village is actually the village made by Ganja from Irumui's body. They spend a few days in the village since it's a safe place from the creature out there. Rico finds Vueco and frees her from the depths and she tells Rico the true nature of the village and the villagers. In the meantime Reg reunites with Fapta but he couldn't remember anything about her. When Reg returned into the village with one of Fapta's arm because he wanted to trade that for Nanachi who sold himself to Belaf so he would reunite it with a copy of Mitty owned by him. 
a bit complicated and doesn't matter. So, when Reg returned he was attacked by a giant guardian of the village and he used his incinerated to defeat it but in that process he made a giant hole into the village and now Fapta can enter there and revenge her mother. A lot of the villagers died and the creature from the sixth layer invade the village. Fapta fighted with everyone, villagers, creatures and even Reg because he wanted to stop her. Meanwhile, Belaf decided to release Nanachi and pay for his sins. He used his powers to give Fapta his memories and in this way she learns about her mother. Wazukan died while he protected Vueko from the monsters. Well, technically he just falls into a pit, but that's another story. Fapta finally decides to team up with Reg and kills the creature who invaded the village but she still eats all the villagers but that's because they wanted that so they can pay for their sins. Vueko wanted to meet Fapta so she can see Irumi's child but the village was destroyed in the rampage so the curse was present again and Vueko was affected by it and transformed into a hollow. But in her last breath she still meets Fapta and she can die peacefully along Irumui who was finally killed and freed of her misery. Reg invited Fapta to come with them into the rest of the adventure like he promised and she accepted and now all five of them continue their journey. But that's the end of the story, at least for now. I'll cover the rest of it when it comes out and I'm afraid to say that will be long time until that. But hey, if you are still interested in Maiden Abyss, well, then be sure to be subscribed because in the next video we'll discuss about the environment of the abyss and the creature and fauna found there. Hope I'll see you there. Until that, have a wonderful time. Bye bye.